the rule of law is an expression uh, that I think most of us uh, have been familiar with as an expression uh, for very, very uh, many years. We've heard politicians including it among a list of desirable things, uh, usually along with freedom and democracy and things of that kind. We've heard judges using it. Uh, and they tend to say, Parliament couldn't possibly have intended uh, to enact this because that would violate the rule of law. Uh, and we've heard the expression used in very uh, um, dignified international instruments, uh, like the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights and the Treaty of European Union. Uh, but on none of these occasions, uh, on the whole, has anybody ever paused, having invoked the rule of law, to say what they actually mean by it. Uh, and then, in, nine, in 2005, Section 1.1, the Constitutional Reform Act of that year, by amendment, enacted, nothing in this act shall detract from the existing constitutional principle of the rule of law. Well, now, <coughs> uh, from that, uh, we uh, derive that there is an existing constitutional principle uh, and that the Act doesn't detract uh, from it. Uh, but anybody who looks through uh, the back of the Act, or indeed elsewhere, uh, to find a definition doesn't find one. Uh, and I, my own view is very wise not to try and give one because uh, of the difficulty um, of it. But, I mean, this now is recognized by statute as a principle of our Constitution, that is, of the most basic rules that govern uh, this uh, country. Uh, and that, of course, means that a time is bound to come, and has indeed already come, when uh, people in court invoke it, and they say, we're relying on this constitutional principle. Uh, and so, uh, sort of vague obfuscation as to what it actually means uh, account uh, be pursued. Now, I've attempted, um, first of all, in a, a sentence uh, to sum up, in, I'm afraid, a rather legalistic way, uh, what the crux of this is. Uh, and I think it is really this, uh, that all individuals and organizations within the state, whether public or private, are bound by and entitled to the benefit of, quite important there, laws prospectively promulgated uh, and publicly administered in the courts. Uh, now that's quite a mouthful, and what uh, this little book really consists of is trying to spell out in, in a little bit more detail, and indeed in a way uh, that um, is intended to be extremely accessible to anybody, whether they're a lawyer or not, is what this actually means. And so I've suggested eight principles. Now, the first of these, you may say, well, goodness me, what could be more obvious than that, um, is that the law should, so far as possible, be clear, accessible, uh, and intelligible. If we're all bound to obey the law, uh, and if we're entitled to the benefit of it, we do need, without undue difficulty, uh, to be able to find what the law is. And you may say, well, surely there's no problem about that. Well, there is a problem. Uh, with governments churning out thousands of pages of legislation every year, and those thousands of pages of legislation being uh, supplemented uh, by um, uh, thousands more pages of, of ministerial orders made under statute, it is extremely difficult to know what the law is, not least because provisions are amended and then the amendment is amended and then the amendment to the amendment is amended. And there's a case which I recount in the book uh, where a man uh, was the subject of a compensation order for £66,000 and it was only at a very late stage and by chance that it emerged that the order under which uh, this order had been made had been revoked seven years earlier and nobody could have found it out. However, pointing a, a finger of accusation at Parliament isn't good enough because the judges themselves are given to extreme prolixity and length and complication. And they do not do, in my opinion, what they might do uh, to make the law uh, as simple and straightforward as they might. 
Uh, and this is true at the highest level where you get five people all giving their own take on something. That's point one. Point two is that by and large, uh, we should be governed by law and not discretion. We don't want, by and large, to be subject to the arbitrary whim of some autocrat, uh, whether he be a minister or an official or a judge. And it occurred to me this morning uh, that you couldn't really get a much better example than that, uh, than the execution of John the Baptist by Herod. Why did he do it? Because of something terrible that John the Baptist had done? No, uh, because he promised his daughter uh, that in return for her wonderful dancing, uh, he would give her anything she wanted. Um, and anything more utterly contrary to the rule of law than that, it would be quite hard to imagine. Uh, the third thing I um, uh, elaborate a little is equality before the law. And again, you'll say, well, that's quite obvious. Uh, surely we're all equal before the law. Well, um, slaves weren't equal. Uh, a number of uh, religious believers were not equal until relatively uh, recently. Uh, women were not equal um, until uh, recently. And there is a tendency, not just in this country but elsewhere, uh, to treat non-nationals unequally, uh, not simply in an immigration context. Uh, but for other purposes as well. Fourth point I make uh, is that the exercise of public powers, i.e. powers publicly conferred by statute, uh, should be exercised by those on whom they're conferred reasonably, fairly, honestly, and importantly, for the purpose for which they are conferred. I mean, many of you will recall the example when the Terrorism Act the Terrorism Act was invoked uh, to um, exclude a man who told the Home Secretary at the Labour Party conference that he was talking rubbish. Uh, it, it was the Foreign Secretary, not, not, not the Home Secretary. Um, so we, it's a very important principle. We elect members of Parliament. We give them authority to make laws. They make laws. The laws bind us. But we don't give it, the people who are given powers by those laws, a blank check. We give them power to do what the statute says they can or must do. Sixth point, dispute resolution. Uh, we live in a society where private vengeance is discounted. If you are owed a lot of money by somebody, uh, you don't um, hire a lot of heavies to go and threaten the man uh, until he pays you, as used to happen in um, Russia after um, Glasnost and um, so on. But there is a corollary of this. I mean, if in the last resort, I'm not advocating resort to litigation, litigation does not on the whole lead to happiness. Uh, I'm not certainly discounting arbitration, mediation, conciliation, and other words of resolving cases out of court. They're entirely beneficial. But in the last resort, uh, if we have rights to assert or to defend, we ought to be able to go to a court established by the law of the land in order to get an answer, assuming uh, that it isn't a frivolous or stupid or utterly uh, hopeless uh, contention. That, you may say, again, is completely obvious, but we all, I think, know uh, that the expense of litigation uh, is such uh, as to make it very, very difficult and a formidable undertaking uh, for anybody except the very rich or the legally aided, a diminishing group, uh, to go to court uh, for almost any purpose. This isn't a new problem. Uh, in uh, the 1650s, uh, someone said, you know, the law is beyond remedy. It costs ten pounds to recover five. Well, it's a problem that uh, some centuries later is still with us, as is the problem of delay. Uh, it's not as bad as Italy, for example, uh, but it does take much too long uh, for cases uh, to reach court. Uh, 
I should have mentioned human rights. There are those who say human rights have, have nothing to do with it. If the law is absolutely clear, the law should be observed, and it doesn't matter uh, how appalling uh, the things are that the law prescribes. Well, I um, passionately disagree with that view, and no doubt Charmy uh, disagrees with it even more passionately, um, and it may be we will uh, talk about it. Uh, but my own contention is that while human rights are not universal, nobody is going to say that women have equal rights in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, to Western European uh, countries, but within any given society, I think there is a high degree of consensus as to what the most uh, important uh, rights are. Uh, my uh, next principle is that the state should provide a fair trial. Uh, again, completely obvious, and you may say, well, of course, a criminal trial should be fair, civil trial should be fair. Uh, I also address what I call hybrid or sort of mixed trials, which are not criminal uh, and are not strictly civil either. But, for example, it's a case uh, where a prisoner is seeking uh, release on parole and there's a hearing before the parole board. Or, uh, let us say, somebody is the subject of an application for a control order uh, by the Home Secretary. Now, these are situations in which there have been uh, and are on the statute book departures uh, from what has hitherto been regarded as almost the most fundamental ingredient of a fair trial, which is the requirement uh, that a person who's the subject of an adverse order, like being refused parole or being made the subject of a control order, should know what the case is against him uh, and have a complete opportunity to argue it in a forum where the judge or decision maker uh, has received no material which he has not. Now that's been departed from uh, because for the grounds of national security uh, a provision has been made that there are situations uh, in which the decision maker can be given material which is not shown to the defendant if we call him that, not shown to his lawyers uh, but uh, shown to a special advocate uh, who is shown the material uh, but cannot communicate uh, with the defendant after he's seen it. And so he can't take instructions and say, well, um, what do I ask this witness? Do you know him? Is he a reliable man? What were your dealings with him? So he, he can't do any of that. Uh, and and uh, the last uh, of my eight uh, principles uh, is uh, that uh, the state should comply with its duties in international law as it should with its duties in national law. 